Welcome back after the long weekend and welcome into fantasy baseball today on Tuesday, May 30th. I am Frank Stanfield joined by all the Chris's Towers and the Welsh today on the show, four days worth of baseball to recap. So you're going to get lots of yeses and nos, not too much talking, 20 pages on the rundown. Let's see how much we actually get. Woo. Um, Is that for real? Yes. 20 Google document pages worth of stuff that I have written down. So Frank. <laughs> yeah, I'm up to 2,800 words in my weekend recap piece. That'll be out tomorrow morning. It's actually going to be the FBT newsletter. Make sure you subscribe to that. And I haven't done bullpens or Royce Lewis yet. So did anybody enjoy their week, which by the way, we're doing this. It feels like it's Sunday, but it's really Monday. So you guys oh are listening God, on what really... we think is Monday, but it's really Tuesday. It really like it messed with my head today. Like, why are there three games on Sunday night baseball? That's weird. I guess it's because it's Memorial Day. But then I was like, it's not Sunday. Yeah, it's Memorial. Yeah. It's Monday. Really blew, blew screwed with my head. Yeah, I actually went upstate for the weekend. And so I didn't, you know, I wasn't paying that close attention to baseball. And then what do you know? I come back today and uh, I've got to figure out everything that happened. So <laughs> here's where we are. Uh, we'll get into Team Name Tuesday, the latest waiver wire ads, all that fun stuff. Before we get started, please like this video and subscribe on YouTube if you haven't already. And if you're listening on the audio side, download, follow, and leave a five-star rating on Apple or Spotify. Let's jump in. Holy cow! How about that? Holy cow! Welsh, we'll start with you, buddy. Oh my goodness gracious, player of the weekend. Well, let's all say hello to... Bryce Miller's secondaries, because we saw plenty of them. What did Bryce Miller tell us? Well, no, I don't even need to do anything with my fastball. It's been so good, I can throw it 80% of the time. Uh, not so much. Little regression in play. 58% fastball percentage here, because he was getting hit. Velo was down kind of across the board, gave up eight runs, couldn't get to five. This is the really the outing we were all kind of waiting for, and unfortunately for Bryce Miller. And this, very curious to see if this is what this is going to be like. We all knew like 80% wasn't going to work. I actually think Bryce Miller can live in the 70% fastball range, but this was the vibe. 58% fastball, 20% curveball, so he really laid into his curveball in this bad outing. The slider... 13%, he threw 11, and the changeup, it was up. As far as whiffs go, the fastball wasn't working, as you can tell. Four of 29 swings induced whiffs off the fastball. He only had a 27% swing uh, whiff rate on the curveball. Slider was worse, only 14%. An overall CSW of 20%. We knew this was going to happen at some point, whether you're a, hey, sell, get off the boat, or whatever it was. I don't think it's the worst thing in the world. It's a tough team to play. He's got to battle through adversity to see what level he's going to be. Definitely concerned with where the usage went and where the effectiveness went because everything mm -hmm. was down across the board. But I don't think we need to destroy Bryce Miller now that he actually gave up a run. You know, he wasn't pitching against the A's. But this is the game we were unfortunately waiting for, and it came out in explosive fashion. Oh, my. Bryce Miller giving up all the runs. Yeah, I'm really struggling to avoid... Uh, confirmation bias just because I, yeah. I've been skeptical of Bryce Miller and just it's not impossible to throw 70% fastballs and be effective in Major League Baseball in 2023. It's just really, really hard. And you can say the same thing about Michael Kopech, who had a not a great start. He got a bunch of strikeouts, but got hit hard. Miller gave up 10 balls in play with an average of 93.8 miles per hour average exit velocity on his four seam fastball today. So clearly that pitch wasn't working. And the problem was the curveball was six balls in play and 98 mile per hour average exit velocity. And the slider, three balls in play, 100 mile per hour average exit velocity. Mm. Change up, 93.3 mile per hour average exit velocity on two balls in play. So Nothing was working. And look, it's the Yankees. They've got some good hitters, although it's not exactly like stacked top to bottom. That Aaron Judge guy is pretty good. He's all right. I Is this the I told you so? Is this the I told you so moment for people that are like, ah, Bryce Miller's no good. You can't do this. He's getting lucky. He's pitching to the A's. Or is this just what we know is going to happen with young pitchers and he can battle through this? Because I think that's a big question. All the an analysis we can have, people are going to be like, Am I still cool with Bryce Miller after this outing? I think it's a bit of column A, bit of column B. Um, 
I don't, I think it's really unlikely that Bryce Miller is going to be an ace moving forward, just based on the, the underlying numbers that we've seen, the fact that really none of his pitches are getting whiffs so far. It's only six starts. And, you know, obviously that they've been for the most part, very, very good, but 20% whiff rate with the curveball, 14% with the slider, even the four seam or 25%, like that's fine for a four seam fastball, but it's not, you know, Hunter green levels. Um, and so I do, I do still think there's an opportunity to sell high. I do still think Bryce Miller is probably going to be more like a high threes ERA pitcher than a low threes ERA pitcher. It honestly wouldn't shock me if he was a four plus ERA pitcher moving forward. So I, I do still think obviously you would have preferred to sell high before he gave up eight runs in this start. But I, um, I I still think there's probably a sell opportunity for Bryce Miller. I think the bounce back is going to be key here. I'm looking for the bounce back, and I think mm -hmm. you're going to see a bigger focus on the secondaries. And I do think it can work because that fastball is so magnificent. Mm -hmm. I think it's a top 10 stuff plus, especially as far as the fastball goes. If you can get those secondaries going with how he's been hitting the zone, I think Bryce Miller be okay. Again, how do you bounce off of adversity? This is a big thing we do in the prospect world that you're going to look for. That's what I'm looking for. I think your sell window is gone and you just hold up and hopefully he can bounce back on it. Yeah, I think it's more the latter for me, Welsh. I think this is a young pitcher who obviously was pitching over his head based on the matchups that he had earlier in the season. Uh, and he was allowing 49% fly balls entering the start and hadn't allowed a home run yet. So he gives up two homers in this game. And, you know, we kind of comped him to Christian Javier and Joe Ryan last week with that kind of like, invisible fastball and uh you know being able to get whiffs with that fastball the one thing we didn't mention is that like javier has a really good slider to go along with mm -hmm. that fastball and yeah. you know joe ryan this is kind of what we saw from joe ryan last year too where he was a little bit up and down there were some blow-up starts in there too because he didn't really have that secondary out pitch well now this year joe ryan has that pitch with the splitter uh i i think we have to see Bryce Miller kind of makes some adjustments here and find at least one secondary pitch that works, whether it's that curveball or slider or whatever it might be. Uh, or maybe it's both of them, a combination of those two pitches, but he's got to find something to pair well with that fastball. Um, I, I'm more so, yeah, in the, I guess, positive camp of Bryce Miller. But yeah, we did know there was going to be some regression at some point for him. Chris, you mentioned the name Hunter Green, and I know he's one that you wanted to talk about as well. Yeah, I mean, we've got to talk about a guy who took a no hitter into the sixth inning, ultimately struck out 11 Chicago Cubs over six shutout innings, uh, two walks, no hits, obviously. And it's really frustrating when Hunter Green does something like this after how up and down he's been all season. And, you know, the, the hope would be, hey, maybe he'll parlay this into you know, maybe he'll start to build, right? And start to become the guy we hoped he would be. Obviously, we thought that coming out of the end of last season that he had figured something out. And I do like not to be a Debbie Downer coming off the best start of Hunter Green's season, certainly, and arguably one of the best of his career. But it's just like, is there a sell opportunity here with Hunter Green? Like, we, I know there's upside and uh, because fastball velocity is usually viewed as a proxy for upside and Hunter green has arguably more fastball velocity than any major league pitcher in the game, possibly ever in terms of how often he throws 101, a hundred plus miles per hour. I do just like, I kind of think this is what he is. Now that's not to say this is what he is forever. There's going to come a time where Hunter green figures it out, but, as good as he was in this start, we're still seeing similar things for uh, for his four-seam fastball. 353 expected Woba allowed on that pitch. Six home runs, six of his eight home runs allowed with the four-seam fastball. A lot of whiffs. That's great. 27% whiff rate with the four-seam fastball. But despite a year, an offseason, despite the, the growth he showed at the end of last season, Still kind of looks like a guy who throws really, really hard, but his fastball is not actually that great of a pitch, and his slider is elite, and that's all he has. And I just – I think it was reasonable to buy Hunter Green in drafts this year with the hope that he would figure his upside out. 
I do think we might be at the point now where it's it's worth trying to get something for him to see if uh, you know it becomes someone else's headache. Yeah, so Hunter Green is an interesting case because, spoiler alert, you know, let everyone behind the curtain. When I'm ranking my starting pitchers, I I like to look at K minus walk rate. I like to look at Sierra and things like that. And Hunter Green is eighth among qualified starters in K minus walk rate this year. So in mm-hmm. that category, and you look at each of like XFIP, Sierra, FIP, all those things, they love Hunter Green. But I almost wonder, is he just, is he someone that will always kind of, maybe not always, but at this point in his career, have inflated numbers. Um, like his ERA will be higher than his underlying numbers suggest because he pitches in Great American Ballpark and he gives and up a lot of hard contact and he gives up home runs and gives up a lot of fly balls. I mean, he's only a yeah. 34% ground ball rate guy too. Nick yeah. Lodolo also had the same issue. If you go back and look, and if, especially if you go and look at um, some of the uh, expected stats versus, you're going to see a pretty big plethora of like him being at the top five of like batting average versus expected batting average, Woba versus mm-hmm. expected. So maybe, and I think Hunter Green is pushing in that same territory. So there, there might be some ballpark factors into these really good pitchers going on as well. Like you were mentioning, Frank. I guess the question, Chris, is what what. What do you sell Hunter Green for, right? It's yeah. I still have him inside my top 40 starting pitchers. Scott and I did a uh, a podcast that we recorded that which came out on Memorial Day uh, about like players to buy and players who like have struggled so far this season. And I brought up Lance Lynn again and you know, three strong starts in a row looks like he's kind of getting back on track. Like is that something you would try to do? But uh, I would imagine you could get like Lance Lynn and maybe another piece for Hunter Green, but that's something that's kind of brewing in my head as like a possible trade scenario, I guess. Yeah, that's a tough one because I do think like, I feel like there are like 40 good pitchers and and I don't know if Hunter Green's part of that group. I don't know if Lance Lynn is part of that group, but when I'm looking at my rankings, it just feels like once I hit like 38, which is where I have Jesus Lazardo, which honestly kind of feels low for Jesus Lazardo. And so it's like, but then I look at the point after that, and it's like, that's where I have Carlos Rodon stash. That's where I've got like Lance Lynn and Chris Bassett and Blake Snell. And it's just like, I don't know how much I like any of those guys outside of that. Yeah, you know, beyond Hayes Lizardo. It feels like there's just like a cliff there. And so Would you rather have Hunter Green or Bryce Miller? Probably Hunter Green. Um, kind of similar mm-hmm. situations where I'm not sure either pitcher has more than one good pitch. Um, But yeah, that's, that's a, that's a kind of tough one. I've got Bryce Miller in that same range. You know, he, he was 42nd for me before this start. And so, yeah, you know, like if you could trade Hunter green for Tristan McKenzie, who I had as a bust this season, even before the injury, but you know, I still like, and he's coming back from that injury. Uh, he's making his third rehab start and then, you know, could be back after another start after that. So would you do that? Like Hunter Green for Tristan McKenzie plus? I think there would have to be a second piece involved. I, I wouldn't do it straight up, but if you mm-hmm. could do something like that or, you know, I was thinking about like Tyler Glass now, but I think whoever has him, they've been waiting all season, right? Like they're probably not going to give up Tyler Glass now at this point. So yeah, I mean, maybe- wins are a huge problem with Hunter Green. That's I mean, yeah. one win on the season. So like you guys are, when you bring in, in my mind, when you bring in the fringier, or let's just call it a big group, a big old globby group. I'm not sure like why I wouldn't trade him for, why I would need plus on McKenzie. I mean, these are all better team context. Mm-hmm. Sure, maybe the biggest strikeout option is Hunter Green, but he has the worst ballpark factor, worst run support across the board. Guys like even Bryce Miller off of this blow up or Tristan McKenzie, the team context alone works in their favor, and we kind of know who they are a little bit more. They just lack the big strikeout upside and yeah. some of those magical performances. I always have likened... um big streaky players to Justin Upton. And I'll be like, that guy's sure. the Justin Upton. If, if people remember watching him and I think Hunter green is like the Justin Upton of pitchers. He can have like an awesome month and then he can have just like a trash month, but now put Justin Upton, this Justin Upton on like a really bad team. And that's kind of where Hunter green is at. Like I talked myself into all these reds pitchers, but I don't know. It's, it's kind of, I think blowing up in our face quite a bit and the streakiness freaks me out. And I, probably be comfortable just moving on to one of those guys that can pick up some cheap wins. Cause we are for the most part talking about five category stuff wins playing some role, whether it's points or uh roto category. So 
you know, to each his own on that. But I don't think Hunter Green stands out over that other group. See if you could move him for Dylan Cease. Yeah, I mean, that would be yeah, that's a good one. not a classic like buy low, sell high, because again, the overall mm-hmm. numbers for Hunter Green are not great, but he is coming off a, a really great start from this past weekend. Something you could try again, Hunter Green for uh, Dylan Cease there. Oh my goodness gracious for me is Royce Lewis, who made his mm-hmm. return on Monday. And it was actually the one year anniversary of him tearing his ACL last year. Comes back, he went two for four, hit a three run homer in his first game back against the Houston Astros. He started at third base. There was another report that confirmed Royce Lewis would not be playing any outfield this season for the Minnesota Twins. And if you remember last year, 12 games with Minnesota, obviously it's a very small sample, but he hit 300 with two homers. He had eight games at AAA this year where he hit 333 with four homers and two steals. Welsh, I know you could speak on this. You know, Royce Lewis was once considered one of, if not the top prospect in all of baseball. He is up to 55% rostered. What are your thoughts? Is this someone that needs to be added in all leagues moving forward? I think so, especially in the land of speculation that we live in right now. Um, you know, I was just did something talking about Royce Lewis and how much of a buy I think he is. Yeah, I think he gets clumped in with these other twins guys like the Edward Julians and the Trevor Larnix and stuff, but he's not, I think he's actually more of like the Alex Kirilov. Remember, you know, we weren't sure. We're like, Ooh, where's Kirilov going to go? They just brought him up. He's in, he is supplant. He's good to go. The rest of these guys are kind of turnstiles. Royce Lewis is not the turnstile guy. They love the bat. They like the flexibility. He played third. I mean, think about this first game back off a 60 day IL year injury, hitting five, and playing third base, not the natural position. He played third base when he was out here in the Arizona Fall League, which seems like 12 years ago. <laughs> and that this guy can play four different positions. I mean, really, we should say six because he can play all outfield positions. I've watched him play center. He can play short, of course, third. I know Donaldson's working his way back. I just think Royce can be the third baseman moving forward. He's a power speed combo guy. You saw the hard hit come back into play multiple hits. I think he is the perfect glue for what this team has wanted. And regardless of the players coming back with Polanco coming back, I just don't think it has to be taken away from Royce. I think Royce Mm -hmm. is up in this top tier. Edward is the next guy to kick rocks. And I think... I I wouldn't be shocked if the team just made a full commitment to Royce being an everyday player. Like, I'm not sure if it would be um, like like the Diamondback situation where there was uh, Josh Rojas, who was kind of moving around a couple different spots. Like, I don't think Josh, I think Donaldson could become the Evan Longoria of that situation where Royce is playing somewhere every single day. So I think he's a must add long way to come back around and say, I think he's a must add. Why would you not? All five categories are in play and he's not fully built off a of speed for points league. So yes. And we know like Korea is not very healthy either. Mm-hmm. Well, this brings us to the next question because uh, Matt McLean is coming off a massive week. Don't do this. I have to do it. I have to do it. Well, as people have this question, I got, I, I got asked on Twitter, this exact question and it is a great one. <sighs> Uh, Matt McLean had 42 fantasy points on CBS last week, five multi-hit games, two homers, one steal. He is up to 64% rostered. Do you want Matt McLean or Royce Lewis? Just somebody else. Like make the decision on somebody else. All right. I'm going to give the real answer. I do want to say from a pure talent perspective, I would still side with Royce Lewis. And I know Matt McLean has been playing amazing. This is like a long-term, like long, long long-term perspective. Um, I would side with Royce Lewis over Matt McClain. Matt McClain's strikeout rate is still pretty high. He's got a 500 BABIP in very in 12 games, which is not going to be sustainable. And so he's doing awesome stuff. Long term, I want Royce Lewis. Everything I just said about Royce, I think he's guaranteed maybe like a little bit less than Matt McClain. So I would find it hard to cut Matt McClain for Royce Lewis right now because Matt is a little bit more entrenched. We, I'm just waiting for the Twins to give us the word. When they give us the word, hey, Royce is a starter all year. I'm going to take Royce over Matt McClain. That might not be popular and whatnot, but you know, Red's got some stuff we're going to be talking about here, here soon. That doesn't exactly put them in a spot where every single player is locked in. Cause they got too much talent that's going to be coming up here. So I will say Matt, but if you give me confirmation, I will go Royce. It is super close. To it. Stupid. Uh, I, hate it. I actually think I would go with Royce Lewis and I, I don't look time will tell, but with Matt McClain, everything that he's done, you know, look, this past week was amazing, right? But 
still has a 28% strikeout rate so far. Yeah. It's a small sample size. I get it. He's not really hitting the ball all that hard. 87.7 exit velocity, 35% hard hit rate. He's making the most of it. Obviously, it's a great ballpark to hit in Cincinnati. Uh, and I like him. I don't want to... This isn't me talking down Matt McClain, but if I'm trying yeah, to... Yeah, why do you not like Matt McClain, Frank? Yeah, why do you hate Matt McClain? Uh, it's just, look, when you're splitting hairs, you got to you gotta look into it a little bit deeper. And, you know, I, I think I think Royce Lewis has as much upside and, you know, he plays for a better team. So, uh, yeah, I'm, Very true. I, w- I would take Royce Lewis. But I think both of these guys, if they're available, you know, like say someone else already picked up Royce Lewis, go add Matt McClain because he's still only 64% rostered. I think both of these guys need to be closer to 100%. How do we get there? Look, these are some shallower leagues where people are asking these questions, Welsh. And I had some people asking, you know, do I drop like a Gunnar Henderson or an Anthony Volpe for for either of these guys? What do you think about that? Uh, hate it, hate it, hate it. Uh, Gunnar has been playing better. Still not great. I think it's still like 210 in the month of May. So it's a still short sample size. I think you could... You could comfortably move on from Gunnar Henderson for either one of these guys. And I hate to say it. I know the investment. And then Gunnar's going to go off and be amazing. You just have to know what you're getting in in for. If you cut Gunnar Henderson, like you, there's someone listening right now that thinks I'm talking to them. When you cut Gunnar Henderson, he will go off. And then you'll have to live with that. Like he will be amazing. And then you'll be so oh, spiteful. Blah, blah, blah. It's going to like, it's going to happen. He has that type of talent, but he, it's like two months in and he hasn't shown enough signs that we have to just be comfortable with making the move. And that's what I'm comfortable doing. I'm good moving off him. There's something about Volpe. I just can't quit. I don't know if I, I don't, I don't think I would drop Volpe for either one of them. And you know, he, I think he had a homer tonight and I know the Praza stuff is coming out and I think people are getting really restless and any moment something could change. I just can't stop. I would go Volpe. I would put ahead of them, but then I would be like Volpe. If I know Royce is good, it's Royce, Matt. And then I guess Gunner is at the bottom. And I hate, I hate to say it because like, he's definitely going to go off now. Yeah. Look, I, then you can thank me. These are the tough questions that you have to answer. And, and again, it's in a shallower league. It's, you know, if you drop uh, Gunnar Henderson right now, is someone going to rush out and pick him up the way he's playing? Uh, oh, not, so. shallow league, I don't care. Are you any different than what I just said? Like, of those order of those four guys, are you different than I, than I am? No, no, I think that's the right order, too. And uh, I'm happy you said that you wouldn't drop Volpe either because, uh, you know, I don't want to just make it seem like it's a Yankee bias thing or whatever, sure. but. He's still on pace for a 2040 season. I know the batting average is really bad. <laughs> you know, it's below 200. Look, at that is what it is. It's it's bad. But Anthony Volpe is on pace for a 2040 year. So, uh, yeah, yeah I, I think I would still put him at the top of that group. And we were talking beforehand, Welsh. One other thing I want to point out. Look, this is all kind of uh, we're speculating right now. We don't know if this is actually true. Ellie De La Cruz posted something on his Instagram which makes it seem like he might be getting the call, but like we haven't actually seen that happen. What's congratulations? Dun, 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 dun. Post a little post Malone. There's a picture of him in a Reds uniform. Uh, post Malone, congratulations. I don't know what the song is called or whatever. I don't know. It's I, I like I have so I get so much entertainment out of speculating off of little uh, Instagram things like unfollowing someone or changing a photo. And then I inversely get more entertainment out of people that get mad about the speculation. So everything about it is beautiful, but it's kind of hard to like, you put something like that out there, you kind of think this is coming soon. So Ellie, Ellie's probably going to beat CES and I'll eat my words, I guess, on that. But you should have picked him up by now. Like that, that would be of all the, <laughs> so now let's throw a big wrench into it. I know we're spending way too much time on it, Frank. Take all those short stuff we, sh- we just talked about. Now throw Ellie De La Cruz into it in Speculation Nation. You put Ellie over every single one of them because I would probably drop any of them even to speculate on Ellie because I think he's coming this week. If you knew he was there, I think you would say easy. But like, mm. if not, if you could, if Ellie was sitting on the wire, would you drop every single one of those guys to pick up Ellie thinking he's coming up this week? In a shallower league, yes, I, I would do that. But um, in a deeper league, you, you know, you, you still need plate appearances and stuff. You just need guys that are playing. So something like that, look in a deeper league, I'm sure you have someone worse that you could drop to speculate. He's probably already rostered in the I was about to say, he's probably not even available. Right. Yeah. Uh, but Ellie De La Cruz, 57% rostered on CBS. That's the latest. We'll see. Everyone knows he's absolutely crushing the ball in the month of May. And this comes right after an article was released on the athletic this past weekend, talking about 
how close Ellie De La Cruz is and the Reds have a decision to make. What do they do with Jonathan India? Who's like their, oh, their team God. leader. It was a very, it was kind of a weird article. Like as well as Jonathan India has played, like why does he have to be the odd man out? But uh, I guess it's very odd how it was placed. And maybe you won't say it here, but like definitely had the smell of like, Red's official put that in his ear. Like, why would we be even have? Why would any rational conversation be around? Like, well, Jonathan Indy, the the team has a decision about Jonathan India. Why? Why would they have a decision about like a pretty talented middle infielder that they can control and who's seen as a team leader? Why would that be the decision, regardless of all these other guys? It was a very odd article, but the thing to maybe focus on is even in that article was, hey, Ellie's coming, and you know, you guys might be listening to this, and we've got the official announcement anytime. Mm-hmm. All right, let's take our first break. When we return, a couple other uh, players who return, Michael Soroka, Tyler Glass down this weekend as well. We'll get into all that here on Fantasy Baseball today. It's finally here. Took you long enough? The moment you've been waiting for. Can we get on with this, please? The movie critics and audiences love is now streaming on Paramount+. Plus. You can't deny the people what they crave. Oh, we got him now! It's fairly wonderful. Oh, I got a good feeling about this. Dungeons and Dragons, Honor Among Thieves, rated PG-13, now streaming on Paramount+. Plus. Welcome back, and for those interested in soccer, Sevilla has conjured magic on the way to a seventh Europa League final where they face UEFA Trophy Specialist Mourinho and his experienced Roma side in Budapest. Catch the UEL final this Wednesday with coverage beginning at 2 p.m. Eastern Time on the CBS Sports Network, and streaming on Paramount+. Plus. Let's get back into... Can I just add one thing? Yes. They could just cut Nick Senzel. They could move him to the Uh, outfield. Right, I mean, or or just cut him. (laughs) He's not good. Like, he's 28 years old. He's not good. He's making $2 million. I don't... I don't... I don't see any kind of roster crunch in Cincinnati is what I'm saying. Spencer Steer actually looks pretty good. You know, he he looks like he might be a a Brian Anderson-esque piece for them moving forward. But like, there's nobody there who, like, there's nobody there that should stop you from having both Ellie De La Cruz and Jonathan India in your lineup. But they've let that happen. Like, you say all of that, and we stare at Stuart Fairchild and Henry Ramos in the lineup. So I agree, but they've let that stop them. They could, at this moment, install CES as the uh, Christian Incarnation Strand as the DH. Mm-hmm. Ellie could be the third baseman. And um, who am I forgetting we're talking about? Matt McLean's already there. And then they put Nick Senzel out in the outfield. Like, we're fine. You're fine. But they haven't done that. And then why are weird articles coming out pretending yeah. like they have decisions between Aaron Judge and Giancarlo Stan? Like, they're pretending like there's really difficult decisions in that red side. No, there's not. The wor- One of the worst teams in baseball, guess what? Super easy decisions to move all of the players. Like, you think we got an issue if the A's had a good prospect to come up? And they're like, hmm. You know, I know Ryan Otto's pretty good, but no, it's super, super easy. It's just weird. It's all weird to me. Yeah, I, I feel like I do have to defend the honor of Nixon Zell, Chris, because while he has had a bad career, he's actually playing well this year. He's, Two, three, four, four homers, four steals. It's, it's been pretty good. He's, he's a possibly above replacement level player now. Yeah. I just, yeah, I don't, I don't know. It's, I could have picked a different player. The point is there... There should be no real question yes. about whether Ellie De La Cruz and Jonathan India can exist on the same roster. That that player should be Stuart Fairchild, who the Welsh mentioned earlier. Yeah. Uh, let's get back into some Poor of those guy. returns. Michael Soroka made his first start since 2020. We're talking about multiple Achilles surgeries. He uh, was doomed by a three-run homer by uh, the aforementioned Ryan Noda, unfortunately. He was at the Oakland A's, six innings, four runs, three strikeouts with 11 swinging strikes on 83 pitches. I guess it doesn't give you the most confidence that uh, he couldn't turn in a quality start against Oakland of all. It teams, was, but it was his first start in a really long time. And it was a 355 foot home run. It yeah. was one of those that like, I think it would have been out in 17 of 30 uh, major league baseball stadiums or something. So like, I don't know. Th- that's not the concerning thing for me. I thought it was actually, all things considered a a relatively promising start because it wasn't a disaster. And I think it very easily could have been a disaster for Soroka who, you know, had a 433 ERA 
at triple a during his rehab assignment and now you know rehab assignments aren't necessarily always judged by the results but you know i i think expectations should still be low but not necessarily because he gave up four runs in six innings against against the a's i thought the the results weren't as the results were worse than he actually pitched by the way shout out to ryan nota who i believe has the second highest barrel percentage in may he's actually been like absolutely murdering the ball so i was dismissive but shout out to ryan nota you know he might be more of a problem than nick senzel but just putting that out there and uh getting back to soroka the last time we really saw him at his best was 2019 and his pitch mix was very different in this start compared to what it was back then i mean he used four different pitches between 22 and 28 percent of the time uh in his return on monday and, you know, back in 2019, he was really like leaning on the sinker 45% of the time and then kind of, you know, branching off that and using other pitches, but uh, much more diverse pitch mix in this return. He is up to 64% rostered, the third most added starting pitcher on CBS this weekend behind Bobby Miller and Michael Kopech. Speaking of those two, by the way, Bobby Miller had a strong second start up against the Nationals, six innings, one run, four strikeouts with eight swinging strikes on 87 pitches. Kopech. He did struggle. He allowed, I think it was four runs over four and a third or four and two thirds, mm -hmm. uh, but did have 10 strikeouts, 17 swinging strikes on 102 pitches. It was really like his first inning. He got doomed and then, you know, kind of turned it back on after that. Uh, Towers, how would you rank that group of uh, most added pitchers this weekend? Kopech, um, Bobby Miller, and Mike Soroka. I would probably go. Actually, let me see where I've got. I've got Michael Kopech one spot ahead of Bobby Miller in my starting pitcher rankings, and both are many, many spots ahead of Michael Soroka. So, yeah, I, I think Soroka is a distant third there because I just, I there's obviously some upside. He was very good in 2019, but I think the path to regaining that upside is pretty tough. That being said, you know his changeup had a 39% whiff rate in 2019. His slider had a 38% whiff rate. He threw both of those pitches a decent amount in this game. Changeup was actually tied with his sinker for his most used pitch. And the sinker velocity was actually up from 2020, the, the limited amount we saw him there, and back to where it was in 2019. So that's interesting, something to keep an eye on. Um, physically seemed okay, but yeah, I, I would rather chase the upside of Kopech and Miller. I guess I would go Kopech ahead of Bobby Miller. Um, but, you know, Kopech is... I still think he's a one pitch pitcher, you know, and, and that pitch was good today, but the velocity was down a little bit from where it had been the last couple of starts. And, you know, it wasn't quite as effective and he got hit pretty hard. You know, that was five balls in play, 101 mile per hour average exit velocity allowed for Michael Kopech. So I don't think any of those three are guarantees. Yeah. I think I would take Bobby Miller at the top of that group. Uh, but then, you know, there's a conversation to be had about Kopech versus Soroka. I still overall like what we've seen from Kopech the last couple of starts. So I guess I would take him, but uh, yeah, it's um, I think it's close between uh, Kopech and Soroka. But potentially burying the lead here. I mean, Liam Hendricks made his return to the mound uh, yeah. just four months after a cancer diagnosis. It's just like remarkable stuff. It's, you know, we'll be watching to see what happens with the results here but obviously like the results are second to like what yes. liam Hendricks had to deal with here he did give up two runs in an inning of work but again just great to have him back uh fastball velocity down two miles per hour i think you know if if he stays on the mound and stays healthy eventually kind of works his way back into that closer role but you know we'll just kind of see where it goes from here and this wasn't a return on monday but did return this weekend and uh, a long awaited return back from tommy john surgery tyler glass now Bit of a mixed bag going up against the Dodgers. Obviously a tough lineup there to uh, face in your first start. He went four and a third, three runs allowed, eight strikeouts to one walk. So you like that K to walk ratio. 17 swinging strikes on 83 pitches, but allowed eight hard hits. 101.1 was the average exit velocity in this one. Welsh, what'd you see from uh, Tyler Glass now in his return? And I don't know if you just had to ballpark, you know, where does he rank? rest of season i think i have him like top 25 or top 30 he's like right on that fringe yeah um, i was and moving forward yeah i was gonna say 30 i think like th like 30 feels like pretty good right now i but i think tyler glass now has a potential to break inside the top 20 if things can get back right again 
Um, it was good. I think it was a, it was a solid early performance. This is what you want. Fastball uh, hitting 96, uh, almost 97 heavy usage. As far as the whiff rate goes, slider was big whiff rate uh, on this. Fastball made it happen. Uh, he got it's, it's interesting too. His slider batting average uh, was one was a perfect well, 1,000, and the expected was right around there, but it had a 62 percent whiff rate. So you know, I mean, he's going to pound the zone. He's got to get deeper into games. I'm encouraged. I think the stuff is still, still there, and that's like kind of the big thing I'm concerned with. And what I also like about it is I still think there's a general fear. So as much as like you say 25 to 30, I say 30. I think he could probably be had in that 35-ish, 40. There might be a little bit of a discount. Maybe someone's trying to get out from under, unless it was someone that was stashing and reaping huge benefits. Like that's a guy I think I would take a chance on buying that there's more upside through the rest of the year. Because I really do think he can break the top 20 if everything's right. Because look at how the Rays have been playing too so much offensive support we just got to get him to five maybe he's not the best in quality starts leagues but uh i'm, I'm encouraged by the first outing for glass now all right let's get into the waiver wire and some hitters here which outfielder do you like most in a categories league jose siri in 25 games since returning from the il he's only batting 222 but he's doing that with seven homers and four steals tons of barrels that is a 42 homer, 24 steal pace over 150 games. Leody Tavares really having a great May. He's batting 395 with two homers, 15 runs, 15 RBI, and four steals. I guess it helps that he plays for the the juggernaut known as <laughs> the Texas Rangers right now. It's like their offense has been amazing all season long. And uh, Jake McCarthy made his return over the weekend in four games since returning. He has three hits and three steals. Towers, uh, how do you rank those names in? A category league, Siri, Tavares, Jake McCarthy. I go Siri, Tavares, Jake McCarthy in that order. I, I, McCarthy is like, he's going to be such a nice source of steals that he just needs to give you anything as a hitter. You know, he needs to not hit 143 or whatever it was before he got sent down. And so like, if he hits 265, he's probably just a starting caliber player. In Roto, I, I really like what we've seen from Siri, though. The quality of contact metrics are really good. Uh, expected batting average for the season is 257. Like you said, he's got that big homer and stolen base pace. So I would rank him highest. Tavares, though, he's got the highest line drive rate of his career. He's got the lowest strikeout rate of his career. His expected Woba is 328, which is not great. It's maybe a little bit above average. I think average is right around 323 or something like that. But it would be by far the best of Leody Tavares' career. I think last year he was like 289 or something. So he's certainly shown some improvements. Sorry, 278 uh, last year. So, yeah, he's showing some real improvement. There's like, I would say like 10 homer, 20 steal potential there for Tavares. Maybe more in the stolen base category. Um so not huge, but you know, I, I think he can be a useful player in categories leagues. In deeper leagues, Luis Garcia went six for six with two doubles, three runs, two RBI on Friday. Uh, just the third player in national slash expos team history with six hits in a game. And then he followed that up with two back to back oh for five games. <laughs> so, <laughs> that's how you even it out, Luis Garcia. Uh, he is 22% rostered. He's got three homers and three steals on the season. Zach McKinstry, quietly having a really good year for the Tigers so far. He went three for four with a sock and a shoe on Saturday, and then he added two more steals on Sunday. He's now batting 291 with four homers and 10 steals and has let off nine games in a row for the Detroit Tigers. Michael Massey, three straight multi-hit games. He is having a great May so far, hitting 324 with four homers and two steals. Akil Badu went one for four with a grand sock and a shoe his third homer and fifth steal of the season Welsh any thoughts here let's say you know five outfielder leagues or just like classic Roto I think any of these names could be in play uh Luis Garcia Zach McKinstry Michael Massey and Akil Badu Zach McKinstry is actually my favorite uh to my own surprise through it uh, <laughs> I love the barrel percentage if anybody heard last week I did a show with Eno Saris talking about uh really the usefulness of um, uh, baseball savant and especially kind of like the, 
you know, the charts that you get and everybody's screenshots. And one of the things that kind of came out of it universally was there's a lot of stuff that might not necessarily be really sticky and useful, but like barrel percentage is one that really should get maybe, you know, a little bit more focus and 74 percentile barrel percentage for Zach McKinstry, who also stealing a bunch of bases we didn't see. Uh, you want to get into the expected world. All of those are working more in favor of what he's currently doing. He's destroying fastballs and it holds up. XPA is actually higher on fastballs and he's done the same thing against breaking pitches. He's just not really being beat right now. He's playing a little over his head, but he's actually my favorite. And I think in some formats he's qualifying. He's already got that third base eligibility. So I like him. I kind of like Luis Garcia and my like levels go a lot further down uh, for the rest. And I'm not a a Kiel Badu guy, um, but I would focus on Zach McKinstry. The thing, the one thing with McKinstry and I I agree, he's by far the, the most interesting of this group is just, he has yet to start a game against a lefty so far this season. So that's the the one thing. He's batting leadoff against righties. He's playing every day. They just apparently haven't faced a lefty yet because uh, in this last three nine games. So that's the one thing. I'm, he's he's been you know nine plate appearances. He's got four walks against them. So it's it's not that he's been ho- horrible when he's had the opportunity, but you know he's I, I think a clear tier or two below the Siri Tavares. Um, Tavares, excuse me. Uh, Leo, yeah. yeah. I just want to point out, like, I am so much less, I think, against platoon players than I used to be in the past, especially as the leagues get deeper. I mean, mm-hmm. Josh Lowe has lived in that and been one of those valuable sure. players being a predominant versus righty type of guy. And there, there's a small part of me that is like, man, I actually welcome more platoon players that get put in the position to succeed where they can on my bench. And Zach McKinstry lives that world. That's a player that you pick up. He's a bench guy. Weekly, you're trying to figure out, like, do I get him in my lineup? But it's like, if you can take advantage of the positive platoon where he is destroying things in a certain level and the team puts him in the best position to succeed and not get into those big slumps, I don't know, there's something to it. It's always going to, it's going to fade. Josh Lowe's not going to end as a first overall, you know, first round talent but he's putting up those numbers and I don't know, I'm kind of into that for my, and, my bench bats. And from the perspective that it doesn't hurt your ratios. Yeah. Uh, you know, exactly. there's, there's some value there too. It's, it definitely like a 10 team league or a point, most points leagues, it's going to be really hard to make use of a Zach McKinstry every week, but we're like, probably not talking about those guys in yeah. 10 team leagues anyways. For but people. the tigers have apparently played nine straight right-handed starters. So like Zach McKinstry would have been a really good starter for the last week and a half or so. Yeah. Yeah. And I think we can see if you play in a daily lineup league, that would be fantastic. Anyone who has splits like that, where you could just kind of take advantage and throw them in whenever he's in the lineup. uh, Yeah. I think McKinstry, if you play in like a, a daily categories league does make some sense there as well. Let's get into some waiver wire pitchers and uh, the name that really stood out from Monday's action, Logan T Allen. Does not want to give up his rotation spot because we know Tristan McKenzie and Aaron Savali are are getting close to a return. So someone's going to have to get the boot in this Guardians rotation. Um, Maybe it's like Cal Quantrill or whatever. But yeah, Logan T. Allen made his case. He was awesome in this one. Seven shutout with 10 strikeouts, 19 swinging strikes going up against the Baltimore Orioles. He limited the hard contact in this one. And all of a sudden on the season, he's got a 272 ERA. The whip is a little bit higher. He's uh, He has a really high BABIP. I, I feel like maybe he's been unlucky in that way. But uh, Logan C. Allen, 67% rostered. I think he's in that same conversation as the names we mentioned earlier, like the Bobby Miller, Kopech, uh, and Soroka group. I think I probably would take Bobby Miller over him, but then after that, it's it's Logan Allen for me. Welsh, what do you think? Yeah, and fun. it's funny too. Every time I feel like we talk about him, it's like the Patrick Bateman meme, the ooh, yeah, you know, just the ooh meme when you look at it. But funny enough, not to start this conversation, but boy, it's not a pretty baseball savant page when yeah. you go and look. It is very blue. It doesn't have a, it doesn't, it doesn't let you walk away with like really pretty feelings about like how this is going to progress. Strikeout rates a little bit lower. This is a tough, like, what they're doing versus where Bobby Miller is going to be as things go on. I I mean, Bobby Miller to me has clearly won that rotation spot over Gavin Stone, Sia. So I do feel more comfortable about that. There are and, bigger questions with the Guardians. So I'm going to lean Bobby Miller, but like Logan Allen is beating up that baseball savant stuff. And uh, he's performing at a really, really positive level. And I also think that they need 
that lefty in the rotation. So I don't think Logan Allen's going anywhere. I think both guys are good. Um, Logan Allen might be the right answer, but I like the little bit more upside with Bobby Miller. The Dodgers did already confirm that Bobby Miller will make at least one more start. He's pitching Sunday against the Yankees. That's he hasn't exactly shown huge swing and miss stuff yet. So I'm not sure I would want to trust him uh, in that start. But, you know, the fact that he's getting that start, I think, is a good sign. Other names that pitched well this weekend. Jared Schuster has turned in three solid starts since returning to the Braves rotation. He allowed three runs over five and two thirds against the Phillies. Alex Wood, a solid start at the Brewers, five and two thirds, one run, five strikeouts there. Griffin Canning has put together two solid starts in a row. He was at the White Sox on Monday night. He went six innings, three runs, nine strikeouts to zero walks with 20 swinging strikes on 87 pitches towers does anyone stand out here from this group jared schuster alex wood griffin canning if we're not including allen no i don't think anybody here stands out i I think they're all probably if any of them cracked my top 100 I i would be pretty surprised right now i'll point out with schuster he threw his slider a career high 45% mm-hmm. in that start, and it has been a really good pitch for him. 154 batting average against a 33% whiff rate so far this season. So perhaps he's finding success using that, and he'll continue to use it more moving forward. But uh, overall, I do agree with you. This next group, uh, not the most exciting, but they are pitching uh, kind of well. I guess we could say that. <laughs> Michael Lorenzen got back on track with a quality start up against the White Sox. Six and two-thirds, two runs allowed, four strikeouts. Dean Kramer has allowed three earned runs or fewer in five straight games. He was up against Texas this weekend, six and a third, three runs allowed with five strikeouts. Garrett Whitlock was solid in his return to the Red Sox rotation. He was at the Diamondbacks, five innings, one run, four strikeouts to zero walks. And Kyle Bradish had a strong start up against Texas, six and two thirds, one run, four strikeouts there. Uh, Welsh, anything on this group, anyone that stands out, Bradish, Whitlock, Dean Kramer, and Michael Lorenzen. In deeper leagues, I've got interest in Bradish and Whitlock. Um, you know, Bradish outside of the New York Yankees game, he's got three of his last four. He's given up uh, one earned run or less, which is nice. Uh, walks have been a little bit all over the place, but I'm I can still I think he's a streamable option. I kind of think Garrett Whitlock is too. Uh, the Diamondbacks' performance was solid, but he's gotten you know he's definitely got more blown up. Maybe the walks aren't going to be as big of an issue, but I also don't think the strikeouts are. I probably would lean Bradish. It's a kind of minimal excitement group, but those are the only two that get anything going if I'm looking to stream. In the deepest of leagues, we're talking 15 team mixed, maybe even like AL only here. Uh, Daniel Lynch had a solid first start of the season up against the Nationals, five and a third, two runs allowed, six strikeouts. Did have 14 swinging strikes on 95 pitches. And Mike Myers took a combined. Perfect game into the eighth inning on Monday. That's spelled M-A-Y-E-R-S. He is a former reliever for the Angels back in the day. Uh, But he's now made two starts for the Royals, and he's looked pretty good in both of them. Uh, Towers, anything here? The deepest of leagues, Daniel Lynch, Mike Myers. I mean, I feel like you left some stuff off Mike Myers' uh, resume. Beloved Canadian comedic actor, (laughs) uh, terrifying... uh, slasher horror movie star so i was i was basically raised on austin powers so that um that's the first thing you think of when you think of mike myers real quick though i think this is gonna like age everybody. wayne's world what? for me wayne's world for me too yeah. frank wayne's have you ever world seen fan. wayne's world yes i actually watched it for the first time on the flight to my honeymoon it was great i have no idea if that movie has aged well i have not watched it in i thought it was 15 so- years so funny it was it's no, it's, it's, it's hilarious i quote it all the time uh, but you but you were austin powers that's yes. what you said that's your mike my okay so it's and a little age thing that sums up our interest level in daniel Litch and mike myers all <laughs> right well let's take <laughs> our uh, final break we'll hit some news and notes that i've got some other leftovers from the weekend we'll do that right after this yeah baby two teams take a final bow in budapest who will edge their name on the europa league history on cbs sports network and streaming live on paramount plus the news and notes from the long weekend jacob degrom threw a 31 pitch bullpen session on friday and was able to use all of his pitches all right progress juan soto sat out sunday with back tightness but is expected to return on tuesday Bryce Harper is unlikely to play first base until after the All-Star break. Cedric Mullins left Monday with a right groin adductor strain. 
uh, he'll undergo further examination. The Pirates revealed that they expect O'Neill Cruz to remove his walking boot in the next 10 days. At that point, Cruz will begin regaining strength and range of motion in his surgically repaired left leg. He's not expected to return until sometime in August at the earliest. Tristan McKenzie is scheduled to make his third rehab start at AAA on Tuesday. Carlos Rodon threw a bullpen session Friday and is reportedly doing well. He was slated to throw another one on Monday. I saw something about it. I think it was 20 pitches, and and so far, so good. It sounds like he's all right. Uh, yeah, he threw a 20-pitch bullpen session at high intensity on Monday. So that's Carlos Rodon. Again, there's no timetable. It's, maybe it's late June. If they really just want to kind of play it safe, maybe it's like the second half of the season. But it seems like things are trending in the right or direction. Never. Or never. Yeah. We'll never see him. Don't you, don't you dare, Welsh. I, <laughs> I, I'm waiting on him in a few leagues, and man, I need it bad for Carlos Rodon. Uh, Max Muncy will undergo an MRI on his left hamstring after leaving with a cramp on Sunday. Lars Newbar exited Monday with lower back spasms. And speaking of the Cardinals, their fifth starter spot will come down to Matthew Libertor or Steven Metz. They will not use the six-man rotation. Uh, I think Steven Metz pitched well in relief on Monday, and... Matthew Libertor's yeah. most recent start wasn't great. So I, I feel like Marmol would be the type of guy to be like, listen, guys, we're not going to do a six man rotation. We're going with a four man rotation. This is how we're going to fix this. Like, I don't know if he knows anything of what they're doing. Yeah. Libertor, Matt's, neither one of them, four man rotation. Can, and, and Contreras will uh, catch none of them. That's how we're going to fix all this. By the way, Tyler O'Neill has been released and Jordan Walker is moving to the mound. Those are all of Marmol's moves. <laughs> yeah, it's, uh, right. he's, He's an interesting one. I, I guess we'll just leave it there. Uh, Adam Duvall will begin a rehab assignment at AAA Tuesday. He was batting 455 with four homers in eight games before injuring his wrist. He's 67% rostered uh, and could be out there in some shallower leagues if you do want to stash Adam Duvall. Giancarlo Stanton could begin a rehab assignment on Tuesday. He's been on the IL since mid-April because of a hamstring strain. Owen Miller left Sunday after getting hit by a pitch on his forearm. X-rays came back negative. One of the hotter hitters in baseball right now. He's day to day. Ben Joyce was called up by the Angels. He's a reliever that routinely throws in the hundreds, uh, though he does struggle with command at times. And Towers, I mean, obviously he's going to be like a fun pitcher to watch, but I don't know that he'll have much value outside of like a saves plus holds leagues, right? Now. Yeah, I mean, Carlos Estevez has just been so good this yeah. season. It's possible given his track record that he falls apart and Ben Joyce you know, forces his way into that role, but it's not going to happen anytime soon. At the very least, he's going to have to earn it. It's real like Jordan Hicks vibes where it looks like an incredibly uncomfortable experience to be in the batter's box against Ben Joyce. He's got like a, a funky low three quarters arm slot. And you know, the ball comes just jumps out of his hand. It's, it's one of those ones where it's like, it's one Oh two and it looks tougher than that. Um, but yeah, I, I think he probably only matters in, in saves plus holds. Kent Maeda is set to begin a minor league rehab assignment Tuesday at AAA. Charlie Blackman was placed on the bereavement list and Ellie Harris Montero was recalled. Montero was destroying AAA, but it seems like he'll likely be sent down once Blackman returns. Jesus Sanchez is expected to return Tuesday and was crushing it before he got hurt. He is up to a 290 batting average with a 914 OPS, so... If you do play in a deeper five outfielder league, I would check to see if Jesus Sanchez is available. Trevor Rogers will begin a rehab assignment at single A this week. He's been out since late April with a left biceps strain. Uh, Terry Francona said over the weekend that Cody Morris will be built up to three innings during his rehab assignment before the organization decides whether he'll serve as a starter or reliever upon returning. Lance McCullers is no longer throwing off a mound. Jock Peterson swung a bat Monday for the first time since going on the IL May 15th. Omar Nervaez will move his rehab assignment to AAA on Tuesday. And what happens here? Because Francisco Alvarez has really picked it up. He hit home runs on Saturday and Sunday. He's now batting 269 with eight homers and an 885 OPS. Welsh, please tell me that the Mets do not mess this up. No, well, I'm not going to say that. I'm not going to give you that. But um, I do think one of the, I, 
I feel like one of these rookies is getting the chop soon. And there, and the reason I'm saying I'm, I'm putting in like Vientos and Beatty in here because they really do need to make a decision on where they're going with it because they can't, like they won't make the commitment to like getting rid of some of the dead weight and let's just build up these guys. I mean, I've said like, let Beatty be third, let Vientos be a DH, get uh, Alvarez out there every day. They just don't seem committed to that. So I kind of feel like Alvarez has played himself into the spot and it's Vientos and Beatty. And one of those guys is going to get the smack here coming soon. I kind of think even though Beatty hasn't played well, I think it'd probably be Vientos. And they don't seem to know what to do with him. Um, but no, I think Alvarez is in a pretty safe spot. I mean, just project him out to 130 games based on his current pace. He's at like a 5.6 war pace right now. Like, I I don't know, man. Like, I know Thomas Nito, Tomas Nito has good defense and probably a, a good clubhouse guy, and they like all the intangibles and all that. But like, come on, don't do it. Uh, what I don't think they're going to do it. What worries me more is that Narvaez comes back and they just like play him Go against with, right-handed yeah. pitching or something. It, it would it would be disastrous. And it's yeah. like the way the Mets lineup has performed this year, you know, outside of Alonzo hitting 20 home runs, they have been a letdown. They need mm-hmm. Alvarez's bat yeah. in that lineup. So, yep. and that's, and that's why that DH spot is going to be, I, I think it's like a really critical thing to look at with uh, Alvarez that, you know, one of Vientos and Beatty, like one of those two is going to be gone. And I mean, if that's what they can keep doing this weird weird three catcher situation, whatever, but maybe Alvarez just moves into more, more of a primary DH spot, which would be great for him, which would be great for all of us in fantasy. Mm-hmm. Players who went on the IL since Friday, Willie Adamas went on the seven day concussion IL. He was struck in the head by a foul ball in the dugout. That was scary. Which, yeah. Yeah. It's obviously a very scary situation for him. Hope he, uh, hope he's all right. Tyro Estrada went to the IL with a wrist issue. Pete Fairbanks with left hip inflammation. Jason Adams should once again take over the closers role. Danny Jansen with a left groin strain, which should mean more playing time for Alejandro Kirk. Ezekiel Duran with mild right oblique discomfort. Will Myers with kidney stones. And Vince Velasquez with right elbow discomfort. Some prospect news from the weekend. Grayson Rodriguez. All three of Grayson Rodriguez. No, let me say this again. All two of Grayson Rodriguez and Brandon fought were sent back to the minor leagues. Gavin stone. I have in this mix. He's likely to lose his rotation. spot. I it, it think it's probably going to happen for him as well. Uh, but towers with those three, uh, are they drops in redraft leagues? Grayson, Brandon fought and uh, Gavin stone. Well, I, I've still got one league with Jordan Walker sitting there on my bench. So I, I can't, I guess say in good faith that I would definitely drop Grayson Rodriguez, but yeah, I think probably all three of these guys are, are droppable. It's, entirely possible that Grayson Rodriguez goes down for a couple of starts and figures something out. But given that the Orioles gave him the chance in spring training, didn't like what they saw there, sent him down, and then he flamed out in the majors, suggests to me that it's going to be longer than just a few starts. And Fott, I don't want to say there's not upside there. There clearly is, but I I worry that he might have gotten exposed a little bit. Uh, in the majors, you know, he was always one of those guys where like the results kind of outpaced what the scouts thought of him. And that can go one of two ways, right? Shane Bieber is an example of a guy who ended up making that work. And, you know, maybe it'll be a similar situation for Fott where he struggles his first year and then figures it out. But yeah, I, I definitely didn't like what I saw. All right, let's get into some leftovers from the weekend, and we'll start with some studly pitching performances. Part one, we spoke about Hunter Green earlier. Max Scherzer had his best start of the season, and it was at Coors Field. Seven innings of one-run ball with eight strikeouts and 20 swinging strikes. Hunter Brown put up a career-high 10 strikeouts at the Oakland A's, and Luis Castillo dominated the Pirates. Six shutout, one hit, two walks, 10 strikeouts with 24 swinging strikes. Well, I don't know that there's much to add for any or all of these names, but do you have anything on uh, Scherzer, Hunter Brown, Luis Castillo? Um, I mean, Hunter Brown specifically, I was just doing a video on him. Uh, he's outperformed his season totals in this month as well. I mean, he's been at the top of the leaderboard. I'm trying to recall in my brain. I want to say it was like top 10 Sierra this month. K minus walk percentage was, uh, I want to say also up there. He's just like, like, the thing I've been chewing on is like, man, we all slept on him in this AL Rookie of the Year idea. You know, it was I, I did. It was Yoshida and uh, Masataka Yoshida and Volpe were my main focus. And he's performed at ace level. Another uh, weird one about him, I believe it was 
five of six starts where he went over five innings, he picked up a win. So it's like the guy goes five, he picks up a win. And if you don't, if we just like get our brains out of um, stupid innings, you know, management and stuff. And if he just goes, you might be looking at like a 15 win guy, a 15 win rookie this year on a team that will support him. He can go five. And when he does, he dominates big strikeout numbers. I love Hunter Brown. I actually think he's one of those guys you can buy on right now for the people that are like, oh, I'm selling high and he's going to be capped on his innings. I'm going to buy that because I think he can still outperform as he has through the first two months. All right, Studley Pitching Performances Part 2. Zach Wheeler had one of the best starts of his career at the Braves. He went eight shutout with 12 strikeouts and 22 swinging strikes. Tanner Bybee had another great start up against the Cardinals. Six innings, one run, nine strikeouts with 19 swinging strikes. Mackenzie Gore posted a career-high 11 strikeouts at the Royals. Seven innings of one-run ball, 11 strikeouts, 23 swinging strikes. And Merrill Kelly has now hit double-digit strikeouts for the second time this season. Tough matchup, too, against the Red Sox. Six and a third, one run, 10 strikeouts with 12 swinging strikes. Towers, anything you'd like to add on Merrill Kelly, Mackenzie Gore, Tanner Bybee, and Zach Wheeler? So Wheeler threw the slider more than usual in this one, right? Because that's he, he's another guy who I just... I'm not, I'm never sure how much I want to buy in when he's pitching well because he's so fastball dependent. He actually threw more um, four seam fastballs in this start. Uh he had 13 of his 22 whiffs came on the four seam fastball. Sorry, are we talking about Mackenzie Gore? No, Zach Wheeler. Oh, okay. No, sorry. I meant to talk about Mackenzie Gore. Uh yes, Mackenzie Gore did throw more yeah. sliders in this. Uh 52% four seam fastball usage. Got seven whiffs with it, but the slider, eleven whiffs. The Royals are bad. Um, they're really, really bad against righties. I, I would imagine they're still pretty bad against lefties. Um, so, you know, don't want to overreact. But it was a it was a good sign that he could throw the slider more and, and have it be effective for him. I do think that's something he's going to have to start doing moving forward to, to live up to expectations. You know, 60% four-seam fastballs, a left-handed pitcher just doesn't feel like it's going to get it done. So... It's uh, I, I think that's a promising sign. I don't want to say it's like, yay, Mackenzie Gore's a top 40 pitcher now because I don't believe that, but um, it was good to see. Mm -hmm. Studley pitching performances part three. Marcus Stroman tossed his fourth career complete game, the second shutout of his career, up against the Tampa Bay Rays, no less. Only one hit allowed, one walk with eight strikeouts and 20 swinging strikes. That comes one start where after having just two swinging strikes total in his previous outing. So I don't know where this all came from, but a truly dominant performance for Marcus Stroman. And then we had a good old pitcher's duel between Corbin Burns and Logan Webb on Saturday. Burns went seven innings of one-run ball, eight strikeouts. Uh, Logan Webb also went seven innings of one-run ball, 11 strikeouts on the other side. Well, so anything here on Logan Webb, Corbin Burns, Marcus Stroman. If there are, we'll never get through the sheet. I'll just point out <laughs> that uh, the changeup usage change on Corbin Burns is very promising. That's something to watch because those are the type of things that can be the silent little lead back into dominance when they can find that. It worked. Hopefully it's something he does. So Corbin Burns, a little bit positive. We spoke about the good. What about the bad? Some pitching duds this weekend. Freddie Peralta. He is going through it right now over his last three starts, an 856 ERA and a 205 whip, just a 10% swinging strike rate during that time as well. Garrett Cole has allowed exactly five earned runs in three of his last five outings. And during that span, a 567 ERA and a 156 whip, eight homers allowed over his last five starts. And Dylan Cease had another clunk clunker at the Tigers of you know, look, I know the Tigers have been a little bit better, but this is still a team that I think we want to stream against or at least have confidence against. Mm -hmm. And uh, Dylan Cease allowed four earned runs where four innings pitched, four more walks, did have eight strikeouts, and he is now up to a 488 ERA on the season. Towers, any mm -hmm. uh, lasting concerns here with uh, Cease, Garrett Cole, Freddie Peralta? Peralta, I think you have to be concerned. He's got the worst XERA of his career in addition to, you know, generally underwhelming numbers overall. None of his pitches has been particularly effective. Obviously, that's heavily weighted towards the past three starts. But, yeah, he's not just getting bad luck. I think he's earned his poor results so far. Cease is 
I don't know. It's a really difficult one because I've said it every time we've talked about him, but the thing that made him break out last season, we always talk about the swinging strike rate and the slider and the the strikeout rate and all this, but really what it was last season was he went from a 383 expected Wobon contact last season or in 2021 to a 313 mark in 2022 to 394 this year. And that is the kind of thing that pitchers have some control over the quality of contact they allow, but it takes a long, long time to figure out when they do or who's good at it and who's not, I guess is the better way to put it. And, you know, Cease has lost the strikeouts. Like that's just awful. He's down to 24%, which is slightly above average. That's bad enough. Coupled with the fact that he's regressed on the quality of contact stuff. And right now, Dylan Cease is just a bad pitcher. I don't think he'll remain a bad pitcher. I still have him ranked in my top 25, although that's getting harder and harder to justify. But like the things that he did well last season, he's not doing well anymore. And I don't know when he's going to figure it out. I still have faith that he will. I'd still, you know, like I said earlier, buy low, try to sell. Um, I think I said Bryce Miller for him. I'd be down for that. But like Hunter Green, Hunter Green. Yeah, I'd, I'd be fine with that, too. I think Hunter Green has very similar concerns. So I'm, I'm fine making that trade off. But it's been a really, really rough stretch for Dylan Cease and not just because it's bad luck. All right, let's get into the bullpens for the Phillies. Craig Kimbrell picked up saves on both Friday and Saturday. He's now up to seven saves and is 63% rostered. So if you do need to close her in some shallower formats, uh, I think Craig Kimbrell will be that guy. Yeah, I feel like he's going to be the guy moving forward, even when Alvarado's back. <sighs> I don't think he's better than Alvarado, yeah. but I think it's like, as long as he's good enough, I think he's going to get more opportunities. Yeah, you might be right. They they could just use Alvarado in like the highest leverage situation before that, I suppose. Uh, for the Mets on Friday, David Robertson entered in the eighth inning with a three-run lead to face the top of the Rockies lineup. Brooks Raley started the ninth, allowed two base runners, and then Adam Adovino recorded the final two outs for his fifth save. For the Nationals on Saturday, Hunter Harvey got the eighth inning with a two-run lead facing the heart of the Royals lineup. And then Kyle Finnegan struck out two in the ninth inning for his 11th save for the Dodgers on Saturday. Bruce Dar Gratterall pitched the seventh with a one run lead facing the, uh, the start of the, you know, restarting the lineup here, nine, one and two against the Rays. Evan Phillips pitched in the eighth inning with a two run lead. And then Phillips got the first out in the ninth. He was relieved by Caleb Ferguson, who did give up a run, but picked up his second save of the season. For the Cardinals, Ryan Helsley recorded four outs across the eighth and ninth inning on Saturday. Uh, Giovanni Gagos then got the save in extras. And then on Sunday, Ryan Helsley got the ninth inning with a one-run lead. He gave up two runs, took his fourth blown save and fourth loss of the year. For the Rockies on Saturday, Pierce Johnson pitched a clean ninth for his 11th save. For the Marlins on Sunday, Dylan Floro was unavailable. So JT Chargois converted his first save of the season. And then for the D-backs on Sunday, Andrew Chafin entered in the seventh with runners on first and second and a four-run lead. He did allow a run to score. Miguel, Miguel Castro later pitched in the ninth to pick up his fifth save of the season. Uh, and then on Monday, Chafin entered with two outs in the ninth inning. Runner on first with a two-run lead. He struck out Elijeros Montero for his eighth save and Kind of feels like they're just mixing it up right now uh, for the Diamondbacks. So a little bit of chafing, some Castro, but yeah, I think like 12 team Roto leagues are deeper. Both of those guys probably should be. I hate, hate when you got a little bit of chafing. <laughs> hey, it's the time of year. It's, uh, you know, it's starting to heat up. It's pretty hot here in New York. Let's wrap up with the to stream or not to stream on Monday. There are, oh, that would be Tuesday. Tuesday, lots of names here on the list. And who do I have written down that I liked? Brian Bayo up against the Reds. Kyle Gibson up against the Guardians. And uh, I I wish Alex Fajardo didn't have the Rangers, who have been arguably the toughest matchup in baseball so far this season, because I'd like to see what he could do to follow up last week's 10, 10 strikeout game. Am I remembering that correctly? Yeah. Um, but I don't think you can stream him in that one. I I think it's mostly Bayo and Gibson and I might throw uh, Oviedo in there. Yeah, uh, I don't Oviedo's I don't mind that one. one. That 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 him and Bayo are the two that jump out to me. On I guess this would be Wednesday then. I will I like Dane Dunning at the Tigers. I think James Paxton 
going up against the Reds. I think that's fine. Uh, Braxton Garrett, who is he facing? Uh, San Diego. San Diego. Yeah. I mean, they've kind of struggled this year. Uh, and Don Machado in the lineup. Jared Schuster going up against the Oakland A's. I think that's fine too. Dunning, Schuster, those two are like, and Paxton, I'll even give that. Those three are big standouts for that day. I like all three. I like yeah. Louis Varland too, but at the Astros, they're kind of no, heating thanks. up now too. It's like, eh, I think I'll uh, stay away there. Let's wrap up with Team Name Tuesday. We're already, whatever, this long into the podcast. Why not? From Brian, Anthony Suntanned here. Yeah. Yep. <laughs> yeah. He wrote like the email it. that it's been a long week too. So <laughs> I like least, it. I like it. At least he uh, acknowledged it. From Felix, X Men, Zach Neto versus John Gray. I think you're supposed to read it as Zach Neto. Zach like Neto. Magneto, you know, ah. Zach Neto versus. And then well, it's supposed to be Gene Gray. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah I like I'm one. an X Men fan. I'm going to go with the first. It's a little one. bit of a stretch, but I like it. Yeah. Yeah. They didn't, it didn't, that one didn't grab me. And I'm an X Men guy. Uh, this one's from Rob Strider Webb. Strider Webb. Strider web. Uh, okay. Yeah. yeah. Does also, whatever a strider web. Does. All right. Another conversation, a conversation for another day is, um, I don't know. I, I might move Spencer Strider up to my SP one overall. It's something that I'm, I think you I should, I think that, we didn't mention it, but the quickest pitcher ever to 100 strikeouts in a season. Yeah. Crazy stuff for him. 61. Innings, yeah. I think mean, 61 innings. He just beat like yeah. Shane Bieber in 2020. I think it was like 62. You know, in one third or something. Mm -hmm. it's, it's wild. Crazy stuff. And this last group is from Richard. They are musical themed. All right. So I'm going to say it how it's written out first, but I think there's probably a better way to say it. Kelnick in the name of. Yeah. Kelnick oh, in the it. name of. Kelnick in the name of. Bro. I guess if you kind of just like really enunciate his name, you could just go Kelnick the name of. No, no because then, no, you're going to go Kelnick. Work. Yeah. You couldn't yeah. go Kelnick in the name. You couldn't do the rage thing. Uh, this one is. Cy would buck 500 miles. No, it's no, yeah. Cy would buck 500 oh, miles. All right, I guess you yeah. can go either That's way, right? Delightful. Yeah. <laughs> delightful. Uh, and then the last one here is wit or witch trout you. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> that was nice. That was a good rendition, Frank. Thank you. Uh, and also, shout out to Richard for dropping a new menu. At the Picton Hotel. Uh, we're not associated with them in any way, but whatever. I thought I'd give you a shout out. Uh, it's in Sydney, Australia. So that happened last week. Anybody else who lives in the land down under, go make sure to check it out. What is it? Uh, it's a new menu in uh, Pic Picton Hotel. I think it's a food menu. Oh, okay. <laughs> I mean, is there like a CBS name? Is there like a Frank name to it? Why are we? Uh, no, no he just, he just, I think he just said it. Yeah, oh, I just, okay. yeah, I just wrote in the emails. Like, hey, give me a shout out. Like, yeah, sure. Oh, okay, I get. It. I thought I thought he was like naming something, you know, like you know, the Tower Hour. Maybe there was like you know an hour where the drinks are a dollar or something or whatever. I don't oh, know that there would be a CBS theme thing. That would be a pretty good idea if he uh, if he wants to. Want Richard, to just, yeah. Let us know, Richard, if, uh, if that's something you wind up doing. Wh Whiskey Welsh Wednesdays. Just throwing <laughs> that out there. We're going to wrap there for the Chrissies, Towers, and the Welsh. I am Frank. Thanks, as always, for tuning in to Fantasy Baseball Today. Please make sure to follow and leave a five-star rating on Apple or Spotify. We'll be back again tomorrow. Bye-bye.